So I'll just say, uh, welcome back to The Way of Love, uh, Dial Back Edition. And uh, I'm gonna hand things off to my co-host, Henry, who's gonna introduce our guest. Yes, welcome, and thank you all for being with us today. Uh, we're gonna welcome Lynn Graham. Lynn Graham is a long-time Episcopalian, and she's a member of St. Paul's Montrose in the Diocese of Bethlehem. And that we are so grateful that you decided to share a little bit about the, uh, the work that St. Paul Montrose is doing, and maybe a little bit about you. So to start off, um, can you tell us a little bit about St. Paul Montrose and your role uh, there in the community? Thank you. Montrose is a very small, rural farming community. And St. Paul's was established right after the first bishop of Pennsylvania came. William White and established uh, St. Paul's in 1831. And if you don't live in Montrose for a hundred years, you are new. <laughs> <laughs> so um, over the years, uh, I guess a lot of the old guard has um, disappeared and we have many new faces at St. Paul's. We have um, people from different uh, denominations, people from different places, and the face of the church has changed quite dramatically, I would say. So um, we are a, we have an average attendance of about 30, and we are a, elderly congregation, I would say. Uh, we have no children, um, but that doesn't prevent us from doing as much as we can possibly do in the community. And your role there in, in, the, in the church, um, can you talk a little bit about that too? Um, I'm the senior warden. I, I moved to Montrose when my husband and I retired uh, about 12 years ago, and um, I made the mistake of saying to the congregation that I was still not able to be on the vestry there because I was finishing up my term on the standing committee in the Diocese of Maryland. And um, I was certainly thereafter elected senior warden. And I think we can remain that. So, so um, so, um, my role there, we have, um, at this point, Father John Wagner is our permanent supply clergy. Um, he comes from a great distance to be with us on Sunday, and so we kind of hold the fort down between Sundays um, by lay leadership. Well, then we're uh, I'm talking to you because we know about some of the work that the community St. Paul's has done uh, that really reminded us of this practice of, of less. And uh, the way you told the story, uh, when we first spoke, you talked about how, um, how St. Paul sort of found its niche uh, in the community, and that that was, that was a bit of an evolution and a bit of a process. And um, so could you tell us about, about that process and, um, and the formation of this uh, incredible opioid, opioid ministry that you've been involved in? Sure. Um, St. Paul's has many small ministries. If, if someone has a project that's close to their heart, um, they can always find someone to help them with it, and we do a number of things like that. But we were feeling that there was something that we were called to do in the community, but we did not know what it was. Um, and we were searching. And then at some point, um, a, a member of the AA group said, we had just recently started an NA group, Narcotics Anonymous, in, in the church, and he suggested that if we wanted to support these groups, that we should probably start attending meetings, which several of us did. And we did that for um, close to a year. And in the meantime, I was on the opioid task force for Providence Three of the, of the church. And I was learning a lot of things there. And one of the things that I had learned was about International Overdose Awareness Day 
which is August 31st. So we decided that we needed to do something. So I called together a group of um, church members, the director of nursing at the hospital, the sheriff, the commissioners, I invited the school board, um, the school board supervisors, um, and some business leaders, and we sat down and tried to figure out what we could do to make a difference in the community as far as the opioid crisis. So we sat and talked for a brainstorm for, well, it seemed like forever, and we, we weren't getting anywhere in terms of something concrete. So I finally suggested, well, why reinvent the wheel? Why don't we just try to do this event on International Overdose Awareness Day? So we, we did, we agreed on that, and we came up with a name for our group, which is Stop the Stigma, the Stigma of Addiction. Um, we started soliciting funds in the community. We um, came up with a purpose statement, which was to support those touched by addiction. Not necessarily the people in addiction, but their families and, and those that were uh, related. And on August 31st, we had our first event. We offered um, free hot dogs, hamburgers, uh, popcorn. We, we made it a fun event. We had resource tables around the entire uh, Green and Montrose for um, people to learn about addiction. And we had uh, three speakers who have been in recovery. And we had, uh, at the very end of the evening, um, a candlelight vigil where we gave everyone a candle and they had offered names of those who had died and we read the names individually and pulled the bell. And it was extremely meaningful to the point where it was a rainy Friday night and people stayed for the entire thing and felt that that was very much needed in the community and they were very grateful for a chance to be together and talk. So we uh, finished that event and then towards Advent we had what we call a memory luncheon where we invited anyone in the community to come and feel free to uh, remember anyone who had died from addiction. We kept it very low key so it wasn't a, a you know, particularly follow up on an event. It was, it was quiet. But there again, I've heard so many comments about how that is meaningful to people who are uh, afraid to talk about addiction, afraid to admit they have family members in addiction, and they need a place to talk, and they, they know people that are there understand what they're going through. And um, so we repeated our event on the green again this past August 31st, and we had more people, more vendors. Um, we did it in the afternoon, so we didn't have a candlelight vigil, but we still had the speakers and spoke um, each name and pulled the bell for those who had died. And um, what it has done for our community is kind of amazing. It's, it's brought addiction, the disease of addiction, out of the darkness into the light. It's allowed people to be able to admit that they are having trouble, that they're struggling. Um, it's given their family members an opportunity to uh, express to other people the, the grief that they're going through. And um, it's given us the opportunity to understand that these young people who are in addiction are not some sort of grubby scum addicts. They're people's sons and daughters and family members, and people love them. And they're trying to recover. They're trying to get back into the community. And 
they want to repay for the things that they feel they've done. So they're, they're more than willing to jump in and help us. That, that's what I'm right. it, it, it's, it's really rewarding to see that when you put so much effort into creating a, a, something that, that not only you give to the community, but you also receive as a community right. as a whole. That, 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 that is wonderful. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> um, and OB Christ is not the only ministry that can fall to the ball. And, and uh, in the way of love practice, we bless and we share our faith and, and serve others. Um, how do you think the people of Montrose experience their faith and what's unfold, and how would you describe that interaction of the community and the people in the congregation? Well, um, faith is to trust. Mm -hmm. And I think in the community, the only way that I could describe it is that they, the community would see St. Paul's faith in tangible ways. Um, we have many ministries we, we provide, we donate to the food bank, we donate to the Women's Resource Center, we make sleeping bags for the homeless, um, there is a local food pantry once a month where we take up a donation weekly and provide all the bread for the um, local food pantry. We donate time and volunteer to when the trucks pull in at the, at the local food pantry, uh, we've got 50 pound bags of carrots, like 17 50 pound bags that need to be divided up into little bags for people, and we do that. And um, it's a fun effort, it's a community effort, um, but they know they can count on St. Paul's to be there and that every month the bread will be there because we've taken up donations for it. Um, we have a Coast of the Community program, which uh, started out to provide warm, free warm coats for the children and people in the area, and started out giving away uh, five and six hundred coats. We're now up to about two thousand coats mm -hmm. each season, and that's six different distribution sites. But it comes out of our church as far as getting the coats together and um, the donations and we every Wednesday of my life we go, <laughs> we go to uh, Salvation Army where there are half fights on Wednesdays. So we have a budget. Um, it's an American Legion program that runs out of our church and we buy coats and give them away. And uh, so we do a lot of little things like that. Um, we trust that you're always going to show up and be present. And we, we have um, the parish house was donated in 1927 as a building for community use. And we do not charge for community use. Um, anyone other than a political event is welcome to come in and use the building um, for meetings. For, we have uh, Montrose Adult School. They use most of our classrooms. Um, several times a week, um, so the, the community knows that we will be having church service on Sunday and that the building is there for them to use. When you were talking about the church service and you talked about the Sunday morning experience with St. Paul's, um, you described what I think you called the complete turnaround yeah. um, in terms of hospitality. Yeah. Um, how did that happen? Um, an introvert and when I went into church the first time I was greeted at the door by someone who looked at me like I don't know what you think you're doing here because we were all go here but my sister is the complete opposite and when she moved to Montrose and I went to church with her she's like a people magnet and so we, we got to know a few people I think the basic turnaround was that um, there are fewer and fewer people there now who were thought of as the frozen chosen of St. 
Falls, and we now have all these newer faces and people that have come from other areas and different denominations. And the bottom line is we love each other. We have fun. We, um, we had coffee hours that lasted until lunchtime. <laughs> we have a social night on Friday where um, we started out going to different little restaurants, but we realized that wasn't fair to everybody. So now when we meet at people's houses, um, we volunteer to do it whenever we, you know, we can. And so um, last Friday night, we had hobo night at one of, the, one of our prisoners' houses, and 20 people showed up, and we cooked hot dogs in the driveway, and we pick up the people that can't make it, we pick up the disabled people, we pick up the um, teenagers that can't drive yet, and um, everybody's welcome, and we have a great time together. Sure. Um, so we spoke to Lynn before we she agreed to do this, <laughs> um, and we had a pre-interview time, and it was interesting to learn about your life, um, not only about your involvement in St. Paul's, but um, can you tell us a, bit about, a little bit about your life before you moved to Montrose? Uh, um, where did you grow up, and uh, your story, a little bit of who is Lynn? Sure. Um, I was born, my father worked in the Pentagon, I was born in Alexandria. Um, and he promptly went to the Korean War, and we lived with my grandparents in Philadelphia. Then uh, we moved to Exton and Westchester. So I grew up in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Um, went to church at a very small little um, community, Episcopal Church, which is now in the center of Exton, which is, it used to be two crossroads and a couple gas stations, and now it's, it's huge. But um, grew up in church there, and then I went to school, um, School of Nursing at, at the University of Pittsburgh, I met my husband, and we moved to Baltimore. And um, we lived in Baltimore for 30 some years. Um, I worked in a hospital, worked as a office manager for a vascular surgeon for 21 years. Um, and then we moved up this way because um, my mother was living up this way with her, um, my father died. She was with her second husband who was 98. So we figured it was time to pump up a little bit. So we moved up here um, and immediately found the church. That's where we always feel like we belong. Yeah, what, um, how would you say your faith has sort of shaped you? Uh, I, I, I mean, you mentioned that you were a serious child. I think I was a serious child. Um, I just have always been um, very close to God and um, there was a time in my life when um, the vascular surgeon that I worked for retired and I was without a job. And once I went back to the hospital, um, which I did, but it was not the same job 30 years after I had started in the hospital and I had a very, very difficult time. Um, and it, it was my faith that brought me through time. It was knowing that as bad as a day could be, um, I was not alone. And even if I didn't have um, support within the hospital, I could go home and breathe and uh, pray. I did a lot of praying. I did a lot of reading the Bible and uh, eventually came through the other end of that. But it was only the fact that I that I had God to turn to that got me through that. And 
And I think, I think that um, the region and intentionality has led you to be such an inspiration and such a leader in simple long jokes, and I think that's very commendable. And um, going back to, to the practice of blessing and, and, and all that is done in that community, um, there would be some congregations here that are still finding their niche, or redefining it, maybe. Um, and based on your experience on St. Paul's, what, what advice do you, do you have for other churches who want to share more blessings in their communities, or how, how, can, they, how can they get there? I think the one thing is to not be afraid. And it says it in the Bible all over the place. Do not be afraid. Now be afraid. And it's hard to do, but I think if you assess the community, find a need. It doesn't have to be big, just a need, and jump in with both feet. And if you can involve the community, it makes a huge difference because it not only gets your church name out there, it makes other people realize that there um, are opportunities to, to serve. And if they don't belong to a church, it's a great way to to latch on to a mission project. And so just find something and start doing it. Well, we have been so blessing for us out here to share your story. Uh, thank you so much. I'm Richard from Miami Falls.